My name is Joe Dispenza. I run an organization called Encephalon. I've written four books and we teach people at events uh, the neuroscience and the biology of how to change, how to transform. Well, there wasn't a lot of science to support meditation. In fact, a lot of it was just the exemplars that were mystics or gurus or saints that were able to do the uncommon. And so, again, when you witness that, your faith in what's possible begins to change. I think a lot of charismatic leaders over history that were spiritual in nature that tried to deliver this message, it cost them quite a bit, sometimes their lives. And I think that when you challenge convention, sometimes you look foolish and insane because it goes against the current belief. And when you pull it off, though, then you're considered a saint, a genius, uh, a mystic. And I think um, great quantum physicists were great uh, philosophers uh, that really understood it on a more implicit level that the elements of this are actually uh, part of the truth. So when they started studying the Buddhist monks at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, these were individuals that had 40 years uh, or a little bit less of meditative experience. They dedicated their whole life to the process. I think Davidson's work, Richie Davidson's work, some of the first really healthy studies that were done to show that meditation has really wonderful effects on the on the brain. And, and from that point, I think um, the world's view about meditation changed. I mean, when I started doing this, you weren't even allowed to say it in, in uh, certain companies and government uh, places. We were not allowed to say the word meditation. So uh, it was considered really something that was uh, different from... Uh, the, the culture of the, of the United States, and now it's sexy, it's cool, everybody does it, it's, it's part of life. William James, uh, to me, I thought was one of the great practical thinkers uh, of his time that always stretched the envelope. Young was saying the same thing. There were so many different mystics in the Indian tradition and the Eastern religions that were saying something very similar. Uh, and I think this is a really important time right now where their science and spirituality somehow are coming together in not just in the colloquial sense, but in a very meaningful sense, that, that people are really beginning to realize that they actually can change, uh, that they can heal from a trauma, and, and they don't need anybody or anything outside of them to do that. And I think that's the moment uh, you take your power back. And so because you don't need to go to the doctor to gain information about your health condition, and that you can find information about your health condition or about quantum physics or about the mystical experience, then the next question is, how do I create that experience in my life if I want it? And if you give people those tools and they understand the process in which to do it, they'll, they'll do it on a regular basis. And so what a wonderful time to see that the audiences that I'm talking to today were not the audiences just a year ago. What I'm seeing personally today in terms of healings and transformations that are taking place at our events, if you asked me three years ago if I thought I would be seeing what we are witnessing, I'd say maybe once or twice, and yet it's becoming the new normal. What an amazing time. I think this could actually change the consciousness of, of human beings, and hopefully in our lifetime uh, we see this somehow to be the new normal. The hope is if, if you get enough, a collective network of individuals that are coming together as community that share the same consciousness, share the same frequency, every thought as a frequency, share the same energy, um, and they're connected as a certain level of consciousness. There are articles that have been written that say that collective networks of observers determine reality. Now the question we're asking, is it the size of the group? Is it the amount of energy? I mean, you could be in a stadium and there could be a tremendous amount of energy, but it could be really entropic. And what we're discovering, it's not the size or the amount of energy, it's the most coherent, the signal. You have a smaller, more collective group that's connected in some way that is emitting a more coherent energy, a more coherent frequency, a more coherent message uh, into the field. And 
it produces effects uh, in three-dimensional reality. So I think it's a really important time for us to acknowledge that, that it's happening, and it's happening more and more uh, in the last couple of years. Well, we hope that on some level it changes the conversation about health. We hope on some level that it changes the conversation uh, about education, that it changes the conversation about everything. You cannot eliminate uh, emotional stress. You just can't. And there's three types of stress, physical, chemical, and emotional. That means there's three types of balance, physical, chemical, and emotional. And people could eat all the right foods, do all the right things, exercise in all the right ways, but if they can't manage their emotions, their body's still going to be out of homeostasis and be out of balance. And when we're out of balance and our nervous system isn't working right, we're not working right. And unfortunately, being a physician or being in the medical world is a tremendous amount of stress. And the side effect of that stress is that the human being moves out of balance as well. So is there a way then you can train people to become more heart-centered? Is there a way that you can train them to shorten their emotional responses, to stay conscious and not make mistakes? Is there a way that you can teach healthcare providers how to educate their patients on better lifestyle because the condition that they're dealing with is a lifestyle condition that they have to change something about themselves and that's the future of medicine right there both for the physician as well as for the patient because when the patient realizes that their response to their environment is actually weakening them and the doctor could actually show them tools to make them move back into balance Without a pharmaceutical, I think uh, people will be more prone to want to do it, especially if our data actually supports it. So after we studied 001's blood and we saw that there was information in the blood that came from nowhere, we started thinking, well, is it just unique to him or is it possible that advanced meditators have the same effects? And we started looking at the plasma of advanced meditators and 84% of the advanced meditators when their blood was uh, introduced into other cancers took the mitochondrial function out of those cancer cells so it wasn't just unique to 001 84 percent of the people that were actually involved in the study that were advanced meditators their plasma had the same benefits uh, in in the same ways so when we looked at 001's blood and we saw the changes in metabolism and COVID happened, Hemel had the idea, well, since the lab is closed and everything is about COVID right now, I wonder if the factors in 001's blood could have a stronger immune response to things that I would introduce to it. So he built a pseudovirus that had the exact same outer shell with the spikes as the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then he inserted a dye in there that if the cells absorbed the virus, the dye uh, would turn red, turn the cell red. And, and just for fun, really, just because the labs were closed, we exposed it to uh, the, the pseudovirus to 001's blood. And we noticed that his blood, um, the plasma, wasn't taking up uh, the red dye. And we thought that's really unusual uh, because in the novice meditators, we saw some of the dye uh, absorbed in the cells and some of the uh, viruses outside the cells. So we looked at the controls and they were all saturated with the red dye and we thought, huh, this is kind of weird. And so we did electron microscopy and we saw that when we looked at the cell under the electron microscope, the pseudovirus, the SARS pseudovirus was once again outside the advanced meditators, 001's blood. It was, there was an immunity for some reason that somehow the cell was greater than the, its environment. It was, its inner world was more coherent uh, than anything that was exposed to in its outer world. So we thought, oh my God, this, what is it? What is it that's actually causing it? And when we heated the plasma of the advanced meditators, like 001, we saw that by heating it, all of the cells got infected. So we know it's a protein. So uh, we started fishing and isolating the protein. And 
somehow the plasma carried information that stopped the receptor on the outside of the cell. There was something inhibiting that receptor from allowing the SARS pseudovirus to enter the cell. And it's profound information because whether it's SARS-CoV-2 virus or any virus, it just suggests that the person's living in an emotional state. And the body is so objective that it's believing it's living in a favorable environment that is actually strengthening the body instead of responding to the outer world and the response actually weakens the body. So when we respond to our outer environment and it weakens our body, then we're more prone or more susceptible to things in our environment, large and small. And yet if there's some type of connection, some type of order, some elevated state, somehow then the cell is actually greater than the environment. The body is actually believing it's living in an environment that's really healthy, really nurturing, that, that promotes restoration and repair. And so, so exciting to see these type, type of changes happening uh, in, in the blood of advanced meditators. And the fundamental question I keep asking the scientists is, where is it coming from? That information. It's not coming from their senses, the person's in a meditation. It's not coming from the ballroom. I've been to hundreds, if not thousands, of ballrooms and they all look the same and there's nothing exciting going on in the environment. But the biology suggests that they're in a different environment. It must mean on some level something's happening within them. And those pharmacy of chemicals, those endogenous pharmaceuticals that the nervous system actually fabricates and makes to reflect a new environment causes dramatic changes in the person's life and in their health. So I met Toby a few years back in his clinic. He runs a bunch of clinics uh, in the California area and his modality is somewhat alternative. And so I stopped by his clinic with Dr. Hillary, and um, I know what it's like uh, to run a clinic. He was busy, he had a lot of patients, his waiting room was full. But in his clinic, he used some of our meditations to help people to reach more homeostasis and balance. And um, he was preoccupied, and we talked about doing research, and his credentials speak for themselves. He's a PhD and an MD. Uh, does a ton of clinical research, super smart guy, and um, was interested in like, maybe we should do some studies on what you're doing. And, uh, you know, we kind of shook hands and, and um, I left and he wound up coming to one of our events in Cancun and uh, he witnessed somebody with stage four cancer who was at an event a few months back, uh, get on the stage and tell her story of how she healed from uh, stage four cancer that was metastatic in nature, which means it spread to her bones, it spread to all her organs, uh, and the chemo wasn't working, uh, the radiation didn't work, the surgery didn't work, all the different diets didn't work, and she had a moment at the event that was very profound for her. And the side effect of that inward experience produced a dramatic change in her health. So the next thing I know, Toby is on, at breakfast right up close in my face saying, we have to do research. We just have to start measuring this. And Dr. Hemmel came to our event in Palm Springs in 2020 and um, pretty much a healthy skeptic, curious, but certainly not very interested in uh, directly with what we were doing. But when we sat down and we talked, I noticed that he had an interest in, in hibernation, which is one of the fascinations that I have and he studies cell membrane uh, function, uh, coherence in particular. And so when I started talking about the type of autonomic regulation that we were getting in our brain scans, he got very interested. So when COVID happened and um, we collected all the data, uh, he reached out to me and said, boy, we have some really, really compelling data that I wanna show you. Uh, I'm really shocked and really surprised. And, and so when he saw the data, uh, and explained it to me, we knew that we had something really profound. So any scientist who sees those type of changes taking place 
in seven days certainly is going to be curious about what happens. So the relationships built as a result of really the, the discovery of uh, what people are actually doing in our work. When Dr. Toby first started talking to me about Dr. Hemmel, I, of course, wanted to find out who he was. And uh, he's a very well-published scientist, a researcher with over 170 you know, peer-reviewed papers that, uh, that, he, that he had written. And he was uh, really involved in the twin study where they took identical twins and they sent one to outer space, to the space station for a year, and they left the identical twin on Earth and they were measuring the genetic changes between the two. And, and so I knew he studied epigenetics and how the environment would uh, change gene expression, could change biology. Dr. Toby uh, did a lot of studies with PTSD and uh, our common point was that moment where you have a traumatic event, a really, really difficult moment, and you have a change in your internal chemistry, and that change in your internal chemistry causes you to pay attention to what's causing it, and the brain freezes a frame and takes a snapshot, and that, that snapshot or series of snapshots create long-term memories, and, and people think within their neurocircuitry and they feel within the chemistry of, of that event and they recall the event over and over again and as they recall the event their brain produces the same chemistry as if they're in the actual experience because the body's so objective that it doesn't know the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and the emotion that person is creating by the memory of that trauma and so that thought and feeling that image and emotion that stimulus and response is conditioning that trauma not only in the brain but now conditioning it into the body and so Dr. Toby and I shared the same interest about overcoming trauma and and what that looks like and so his background in medicine as a clinician his background in as a researcher and studying trauma uh, we met on that level and had really great conversations and he came to the point with me where he actually agreed with me that if a negative trauma like that could define a person on their past. A positive trauma or something really wonderful could actually change the body in a healthy way. And so our interest began to merge and I, I said to these guys, I said, okay, most people, 90% of their thoughts that they think in one day are the same thoughts. And if they have the same thoughts, then they make the same choices. If they make the same choices, then they do the same things. If they do the same things, they create the same experiences in their life, and the same experiences in their life create the same feelings and the same emotions. And for the most part, we would have to agree that their biology, their neurocircuitry, their neurochemistry, their hormones, and the, even their gene expression would stay the same because they're staying the same. So I said to them, seven days if we get people to think differently and learn new information to help them to make different choices than they typically do teach them how to do things differently allow them to have new experiences and feel new emotions and teach them the science behind how to do all of those things based on a deep model of understanding of all the sciences integrated together if they did that for one week do you think that there could be biological changes that would take place from their brain all the way down to the gene expression? And I think that that kind of started our engagement and the curiosity behind the fact that people retreat from their lives uh, for seven days. And we asked them to disconnect from their known life, their personal reality, and to break from their routines and stop doing the same things and seeing the same people and going to the same places at the exact same time and give them knowledge and information and, and have them do that exact thing, begin to apply it. And so we see that in seven days when people fully immerse themselves uh, in the process, the results that we saw uh, just in the preliminary studies from the data that we collected at our first event with Dr. Hemmel and Dr. Toby were greater than we ever anticipated. And there were certain people that had profoundly significant changes in their health. 
in seven days. And those people also had wonderful changes in their brains because we measured it. Really, really profound changes taking place in their, in their brain. We also saw that they had really, really high levels of order in their heart. They were feeling gratitude. They were feeling love. They were feeling empowered. They were feeling unlimited. And their descriptions, their subjective experience, correlated perfectly with all of our objective measurements. And we saw dramatic changes taking place, in a few in particular, that would suggest that it, was be, it would be better than any drug. Uh, yeah, that's how profoundly uh, significant it was. So the story uh, matched the data. And we started looking at the blood of a few of those people, and one in particular, the plasma of his blood started doing some really wonderful things. And I think when Dr. Hemmel saw it and Dr. Toby saw it, I knew when they texted me on the phone, we, we got to talk. And the first thing they said is, we have some really compelling data, like really important data. Now, for uh, two guys that are really well published, that have a healthy sense of skepticism, all of a sudden showing me these dramatic changes in seven days. Seven days is a very short amount of time for even a drug to work. But the changes suggested that the body was making its own pharmacy of chemicals that actually started working better than drugs work. And the data shows that over and over again. Now, any scientist who sees this knows that something really important is happening. And so that led to us broadening our research and looking at uh, how the information in the plasma of these people somehow changed their their biology to be more immune to any bacteria, any virus in in the environment. And, and when we started looking at their particular blood, it got to be really exciting because it had very, very significant changes in, uh, in, in people's biology, and it was really exciting. Through our research, allows me to teach with a greater level of conviction that I can say, actually, I'm not saying this finally. The data is saying that your immune system can be greater than all kinds of viruses. Uh, the data is suggesting that 70% of the energy in a cancer cell, in a uterine cancer cell, is significantly diminished by the plasma of that person that is an advanced meditator. That certain genes that are related to Alzheimer's, uh, when they're exposed to the plasma of advanced meditators, somehow alter that gene expression for the better. So I'm not saying it any longer when the data is saying it and people see the data and they become conscious of another possibility, their doubt is removed. Uh, they have less doubt and more belief in their future. They have more belief in themselves and you can't believe in possibility without believing in yourself and you can't believe in yourself without believing in possibility and one has effects on the other and so when people become aware of the possibility through the science and what the science is saying and and what the testimonials are saying then the collective consciousness of possibility begins to change and I think that point where people begin to break through personally uh, somehow has a field effect in the room and then it's not uncommon that we have a person stand on the stage and tell the story of their own healing that four minute mile and someone in the audience with the exact same condition because they saw them heals in the same event with the very same condition or sometimes four times the collective network becomes aware of another possibility and then when that happens there's a change in energy in the room but I think the balance between the scientific evidence is what we see in testimony. We have so many people stand on the stage in front of thousands of people and tell their story uh, that they were once blind and now they're seeing and they had muscular dystrophy and they came to the event in a wheelchair and they're walking. Uh, people with metastatic cancer that spread throughout their entire body uh, with no hope have a complete reversal of their condition. Uh, 
Parkinson's disease, ALS, we see wonderful changes that for me personally, I keep telling the scientists, I can't believe this is the truth. It's, it's that significant. So when that person stands on the stage and they tell their story, that's the four minute mile. Uh, that is saying uh, we broke through a certain level of consciousness and I watch the audience uh, when this happens and everybody's leaning in. Everybody's paying attention because someone's speaking the truth. That's uh, the, the example of truth right there. And just like the four minute mile, once it was broken and it was considered physiologically impossible to break, uh, within two weeks someone broke it again and then there's been over 1400 people. Uh, that have broken the four minute mile. I think it's the same thing that happens in our community. The scientific evidence and the testimony says that evidence is the loudest voice. And so it becomes undeniable when you look at it very closely because people want to say this is pseudoscience and, and I have been accused of that very, very uh, thing. But the amazing thing about it is that when the data says it, I'm not saying it any longer the data is actually saying it. So when we show this information to anybody who is a researcher or in the, in the medical profession, uh, it opens their eyes because number one, it takes place in seven days. Sometimes it's one specific moment for the person that produces a profound change in their health. The scientific uh, measurements that we're doing on a cellular level suggest that a person is in a completely different environment in seven days and for the most part they're sitting in a ballroom and the ballroom isn't much of an exciting environment so where are those changes taking place and it's coming from within the person and that's goes so contrary uh, to how we've been programmed and so contrary to the way we believe in things I personally didn't expect to see that much change take place uh, in people's mm -hmm. biology and and I uh, once again I was learning as I was going because Hemel's science is very very deep it's, it's we're measuring 2,882 different metabolites on a cellular level that's a lot of information so um, when you see a trend in a community that is suggesting that the body is in a greater state of growth and repair and that the, the body's actually in a different environment than the environment they're used to living in. Um, and it's that dramatic. Any person who's done a drug study, and they have all done drug studies, uh, know that these changes somehow are working better than drugs, and yet no one's taking any exogenous substance. No one's doing any change in their diet or intermittent fasting. They're doing anything out there. The changes are actually coming from within them, and those changes uh, have markers in research that would capture any scientist's attention. I think uh, when that started happening, and I, I kept telling them, I can't believe this is the truth. I mean, this is, th this is science. Now it's no longer pseudoscience. Uh, I used to say all the time that we should never wait for science to give us permission to do the uncommon. We should go out and do the uncommon and have science come and study us and that's kind of what's happening right now that people are beginning to understand that that if they're unaware of a possibility it doesn't exist for them and so if you give them the information and they become aware of that possibility or they see someone stand on the stage that's a cancer researcher that had a very unique form of cancer and is on the stage that cancer metastasized to all of her organs in her body and she's standing on the stage saying she has no evidence of cancer right? anywhere in her body. The audience becomes aware of another possibility that they were unaware of and certainly there's someone else in the audience that has a similar cancer or some type of cancer and they're witnessing truth right in front of them and all of a sudden they start believing in that possibility and that's a footprint in consciousness and it's evidence in three-dimensional reality and just like an infection can spread amongst the community and create disease I think health and wellness can become as infectious as disease and you get a community of people 